Good morning uh, again. This is Larry Phillips, and uh, this morning we're going to be doing a uh, study in. Um, I keep saying that this is my favorite part of the Bible. This is my favorite part of the Bible. <laughs> you know, we should uh, love all of God's Word. Um, but there are some parts of the Word of God that gives us more comfort as a believer uh, than others. Uh, it resonates with us. Uh, and each Christian uh, gains different insights. Uh, you know, sometimes our experiences uh, cause us to res- resonate with certain parts of the Bible. A um, number of years ago, <coughs> Oh, it's probably been, oh, 13 years ago, maybe. Uh, I read this uh, chapter, um, John 17, and it really had a life-changing impact on me, to be honest with you. It was um, it was um, absolutely remarkable. I think, um, I think I was 37 at the time, so now you know how old I am, but uh, I... Uh, had never ever heard a message on the 17th chapter of John, and here I was, 37 years old, and it shows how little I had read my Bible up until when I was 37 years old, and uh, I haven't read my Bible near as much as I should uh, between 37 and 52 today, but <clears throat> I've read it a lot more than I did. I've read the Bible a lot more since uh, between 37 and 52 um, than between 0 to 37. So, anyway, we're going to go through the 17th chapter of John. The uh, 37th chapter of John really is Christ praying to the Father for to glorify Him. That's the first thing. And then secondly, uh, to preserve... Uh, his apostles, and then finally, to preserve all of uh, the elect believers. Um, A lot of people have tried to set forth that the 17th chapter of John is just to, (coughs) for uh, Jesus Christ praying for his disciples, but that is not the case, and we're going to see that later on in this scripture. It points out specifically that it's not directed just at the uh, uh, not directed just at the apostles. Verse one: These words spake Jesus, and lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, "Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son may also also may glorify thee." Um. It's interesting here that uh, Christ lifted up his eyes to heaven. You know, he uh, he looked up. Um, he looked up towards heaven while he was praying. And you know, it, it reminds me of that song. I mean, the psalm that says, uh, "I will lift up my eyes unto the hills, from which cometh my strength. My strength cometh from the Lord." Number two, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. That particular scripture has a whole message in it on theology, the doctrine of election. Thou hast given him power. Christ has power, or you want to use the word authority, Christ has power over all flesh. God has given the Son power over all flesh. And uh, this power over all flesh that he's speaking of here is that Christ should give eternal life to as many as the Father had given him. To as many as the Father had given him question that we ask ourselves, uh, or we should be asking ourselves, is, were we given to Christ by the Father? Are, are we one of those that that was given to Christ by the Father? 
For if we were given to Christ by the Father, um, we have eternal life. We have eternal life. Now, if we haven't been given to Christ by the Father, because Christ uh, tells us later on that uh, not all were given to Christ by the Father. See, that's the that's the big uh, <clears throat> challenge in today in the teachings of most pastors. They try to teach that uh, you know we're all God's children. We were all given to Christ by the Father, but that is not what he's saying here. And by the way, this is the last prayer that he made prior to his death. This is the true Lord's Prayer. Uh, Jesus praying to his Father. The other prayer is he's teaching us how we should pray. But here's the Lord's Prayer. So, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Why didn't he say that he should give eternal life to all? And leave it at that. If it was... uh, if, if redemption and salvation, the work of his atonement, was made available to all, why didn't he say all here, every man without exception? But he says that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent interesting definition of life eternal. He says that the definition of life eternal is that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ. There's many people out there that say they have eternal life, but they don't know the only true God in Jesus Christ. How, how do we know that they don't know the only true God in Jesus Christ? Because they are denying the only true uh, God in Jesus Christ's words in uh, denying his, his, his word. They're saying, no, he didn't. Uh, God the Father didn't uh, just give certain people to Jesus Christ. He gave everyone to Jesus Christ. Well... Uh, they don't know the only true God in Jesus Christ by them denying Christ's very words, do they? And and he says, therefore, <clears throat> if they're denying the words of Jesus Christ and God the Father, then they don't have eternal life because they don't know the only true God in Jesus Christ. So part of the knowledge of Jesus Christ knowing the only true God in Jesus Christ is an affirmation that you and I, if we are given to God by the Father, given to Jesus Christ by the Father, is an affirmation that we have eternal life. Uh, It's a very, very uh, uh, strong, strong declaration of election there. Verse 4. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gave me to do. Interesting. Before he goes to the cross, before he says it is finished, he declares here in his prayer to the Father that he's finished the work. Well, the work was finished before the foundation of the world. He was slain before the foundation of the world. I mean, uh, he was, the work was finished before the creation. Why can we say that? Well, a covenant was struck between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit before the foundation of the world. And we can see that in many passages. We're not going to go to all those passages today. There's... Um, in Revelation, there's many different passages that, that describe this. But here he says, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. 
And he hadn't physically gone to the cross yet. <laughs> okay. Verse 5, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Before the world was. Um, he emptied himself and came down here to this earth as a suffering servant. And we've talked we're right around the uh, Christmas Christ Mass pagan holiday season, and and we see that um, uh, everybody wants to worship the little babe in a manger, and uh, uh, here he he says, "I uh, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was." Our worship and our admiration shouldn't be to the little baby in a manger, okay? Our worship and our adoration should be to the resurrected Christ, the ruling and reigning king. He's not going to come back as a little baby. <coughs> He's not coming back as a little baby. He's coming back as the king of kings and the lord of lords. There's no admonition for us in in the Bible to worship a little baby in a manger. Uh, he tells us several times what we need to do in remembrance of him. Do this in remembrance of me. Uh, his body and his blood. His, his body was broken for us. His blood was shed for us. We are to remember uh, his death, his burial and resurrection. Not his, not his birth. Uh, as far as our worship, now it's there. It's a, it's a, a magnificent thing to look at the incarnation of Christ and the virgin birth of Christ. But our worship should not be to the baby child and the Virgin Mary, like the Catholic Church tries to do. But our worship needs to be to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Number six, I have manifested thy name. <clears throat> I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, <clears throat> and they have kept thy word. Well, this is predestination. Uh, how are, how is our, uh, uh, how is God's name manifested to us? How is God's name manifested to us? Well, <clears throat> we see that the way that uh, his name was manifested to these disciples, okay, there was a... Uh, a joint work between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in manifesting the Father's name to these disciples. Um, manifest means to um, to be readily perceived by, readily perceived by the senses and the sight, easily understood, obvious. Well, how can God's Word be easily understood? How can it be uh, received? Well, it was received because um, these men were given to Jesus out of the world what he said, I manifest thy name unto men, which thou gavest me out of the world. So Father gave him to the Son. He says, thine they were. Thine they were. There's a um, indication there that they were in Christ before they were created, before the foundation of the world. They were predestinated. 
Thou gavest them me. So one of the reasons that they uh, were able to receive Christ was because they were given to Christ by God. And the reason that they kept the reason they kept God's word is because it was uh, manifested. Uh, a manifest also is like a covenant. A manifest. There was a covenant between between the Father and the and the Son and the Holy Spirit that these that were given to him by the Father would keep his word. And uh, the word of God was manifested in Jesus Christ by coming in the flesh. Okay, by coming in the flesh, the incarnation coming in the flesh. He said, um, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay. So the very Word of God was manifested in the flesh to these um, apostles. And it says in the next verse, (coughs) Now they have known all they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. All things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. Christ had taught the apostles uh, that they had been given to him by the Father. He said in another place, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The the Trinity is in perfect unity in terms of their doctrine. <laughs> okay, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are not in conflict about their doctrine. We see a lot of conflict in our world over doctrine. You know, we see uh, people that take on the name of Calvin, and people take on the name of Luther, and people take on the name of. Uh, uh, John Wesley and people take on the name of you know all of these different names well the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit are all in perfect agreement about their doctrine all in perfect agreement for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me and they have received them and have known surely that I came out from thee and they have believed that thou didst send me. Um, so Christ had given unto them the words which the Father had given him, and the apostles had received them, and the apostles knew for a certainty that Christ had came out from the Father, and uh, the apostles had believed that Christ had been sent. You know, I've heard people say, well, the apostles weren't really saved until after uh, the resurrection, until after they saw Christ. That is not true. It says here that all the apostles believed that that, uh, that the Father had sent him, and they believed that he was uh, the Christ, the Son of God. He says here, <clears throat> I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them, for for them which Thou hast given me, for they are Thine. You know that's a a really phenomenal affirmation for us who are God's children, who are the elect. God's prayed for us. God has not prayed for the world. You know we could say here. Um, Almost every instance, the world that he's speaking of here throughout these passages, except for one instance, which we'll point out to them, out to you. You know, there are several worlds, and I'm not a Greek and a Hebrew scholar, but you can take any concordance and you can look up the world, word world, and you can see there are several different kinds of worlds. There's the world of God's elect. There's the world of those who were vessels of wrath fitted for destruction. Okay? 
And then there's the physical world. Okay? So remember when you're reading scriptures, uh, those different definitions uh, in the Greek of the word world is very important. Um, there's, if he's speaking of the world of God's elect, that's one thing. If he's speaking of the world of vessels of wrath fitted for destruction, he's talking about something else. If he's speaking of the physical earth, then he's, he's speaking. So you have to use the right context. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world of his elect. Okay. That whosoever believeth in him, well, all of his elect are going to believe in him. Okay. Uh, God did not love the world of those who were vessels of wrath fitted for destruction, or he wouldn't have fitted them for destruction. Okay. Belief, whosoever believeth. Who are the whosoever's? All of those who were given to Christ by the Father will believe upon him. Guaranteed. All of those who were given to him by the Father will believe upon him. Uh, and we'll see later that uh, there's even people that were given to him by the Father for a specific purpose to glorify God that are reprobates, like Judas, that, uh, the son of perdition. Going on, uh, I pray not for the world, for them which thou hast given me, but for them, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. You know, we when we are exalting the works of God, we are glorifying Christ. We are glorifying the Trinity. We are glorifying the Holy Spirit. When we are glorifying the work of redemption, the work of predestination, the work of justification, the work of glorification, the work of sanctification, when we're uh, uplifting those works of God in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. We're glorifying Christ. And he says that all mine are thine and thine are mine. In other words, we're not in we're not in that dispute over who is God's elect. We're in perfect agreement who are God's elect. Verse 11, And now <clears throat> I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. You know, notice here he's not asking the Father to keep in his name uh, everyone. He's not asking uh, his Father to save the whole world. He's not asking Father his Father to... to... Uh, uh, utilize his death on the cross to bring uh, or make it possible for the salvation of every man, woman, and girl and boy with, on the face of the earth that's ever been born without exception. No. What he's saying is Holy Father keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me that they may be one as we are. Verse 12, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. There's a scripture that says that his word cannot be broken. His word cannot be broken. Uh, there in Psalm, uh, in Psalms, um, it talks about uh, the son of perdition. Um, and so we we have to look at uh, the purposes of God according to election might stand. Not of him that willeth, not of him that runneth, but God that showeth mercy. Um, 
that the purposes of God according to election might stand. And here he said that all of those apostles were kept by Jesus Christ in the Father that had been given to him by the Father and none of them was lost but the son of perdition and the reason that the son of perdition was lost what it was that it was ordained before he was born that he would uh, betray the son of God that he would be a traitor that he would uh, 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 he was created uh, for a specific purpose. He was created for a specific purpose and the, the scriptures would have to be fulfilled. There's no way that Judas uh, could not fulfill the scriptures. Uh, the scriptures cannot be broken. And so there was a specific plan and God used Judas to fulfill that plan just like he used Pharaoh to fulfill his plan. Um, and so we see that he uh, uh, he did uh, fulfill his plan in what he did. <clears throat> okay, now we're going to go to uh, the next uh, verse which says, And now I come to thee and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I believe that one of the reasons, you know, Christ could have prayed silently to the Father, and uh, he could have prayed silently to the Father, but he chose to speak, speak out loud while he was praying. And uh, one of the reasons that he spoke out loud is that uh, they might have joy uh, from hearing these words. It might be a comfort to the apostles, and not only to the apostles, but all of those that were to hear and read these words later, like myself, back when I was 37 years, that gave me great comfort. It resonated with me. He says, my sheep know my voice, and they follow me. Uh, I heard the voice of Christ in this when I read this the first time he used this verse as a catalyst if you want to use that word or whatever to get my attention that I was one of his sheep and that the father had given me to the son okay and now the next verse says um, that there that they know well, again just to finalize that they might have joy fulfilled in themselves I have given them thy word. What word is he speaking of? Well, the word that the Father had given them to him. And the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Look, those who are not given to Christ by the Father are going to hate those who are. They're going to hate those who are, because they're going to see a distinction between those who hear and those who are unable to hear. There's a huge, huge uh, chasm between the elect and the non-elect. There's a it's it's uh, like a uh, a big gulf. Those people that that don't hear the voice of God are living in rebellion to His Word are denying his, his word, denying election, denying predestination, denying that that these sheep were given to uh, Jesus by the Father, they're going to hate the people that are affirming it because it goes against the grain. Um, and, and why are they going to hate him? Because he says here, because they are not of the world. Christ was hated. He was hated. He told the Pharisees, you're of your father the devil. I mean, he, how could you be any more uh, plain than that? And uh, 
they, you know, you know, what if somebody walked up to you and told you you're of your father the devil? I'm sure you wouldn't like it very well. Well, these people know that they, you know, we as God's children, if we're his elect, we know that we're one of his sheep. We know inside in our hearts that we're one of God's sheep. And there's people out there in the world that know we're one of God's sheep, and they hate us with a passion, okay? Uh, because we're not of this world, even as Christ was not of the world. And then he says uh, in verse 15, I pray not for the world. I pray not for the world. Uh, I, he says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil from the evil. Uh, what does he mean there? Well, the evil, I mean, we look around us, we see how evil this world is. You know, we see people that are involved in all kinds of immorality, and one time we were participants in all that activity, but then the light of God shined in our hearts to condemn us of our... Uh, uh, and, and even after we receive the light uh, and the regeneration, we uh, many times have walked in a disobedience to the light and have had uh, the condemnation of that in our hearts. And uh, we, we, God has caused, uh, granted us repentance that we would come back to the light. But He's saying here, they are not of the world, even as I am. They are not of this world even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. How do we get sanctified? How do we get sanctified? Do we get sanctified by uh, uh, you know, going down to an altar after we got saved and, and seek a second definite work of grace? No. We get sanctified. Okay, We are set apart by God. We get sanctified through the truth of His Word. His Word is what's the truth. How can we say we're sanctified if we deny His Word? How can we say we're sanctified when the way that we're sanctified according to Christ is through His Word, through the tr Thy Word is truth? If we say, no, I don't go along with that. Well, if we don't go along with His Word, how can we be sanctified? Okay? Verse 18, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. What does he mean by sending us into the world? Well, uh, this Bible lesson is going to go to a lot of people. Now, whether they ever listen to it, I'll never, probably never know. A lot of them probably will get it in their email and just push the old delete button. Because they don't want to hear that Larry Phillips spiel it spilling out his doctrines of of election and, and grace and, and the predestination. They don't want to hear it. But you know, uh, as long as they uh, don't send me a message back saying, please no longer send me your Bible lessons, I'm going to continue to send it to them uh, in the hopes that they are one of God's little sheep and they will run to his word and they will embrace his word. Okay, that is my prayer, and also it will be a fact because all of God's sheep will hear his voice, and all of those who are not his sheep will reject his voice. Okay, and it says here, um, so he sends us into the world, and for their sakes I sanctify myself. What's he mean by that? Well, he. He says that for the for the elect's sake he has set himself apart. That they might also be set apart through the truth. In other words, by his example, he did not uh, endorse or embrace a false church. He did not go in and join uh, uh, the First Baptist Church of whatever. Or the... Uh, the Lutheran Synod or the uh, uh, First Church of the Nazarene or the um, 
uh, United Presbyterian Church or the United Methodist Church or the Wesleyan Church or the he did not join any false church that was denying his word. He did not embrace a false church. He set himself apart from the synagogue. He contended with the people in the synagogue. He told them, you scribes, you Pharisees, you hypocrites, you vipers, <laughs> who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Uh, so he sanctified himself through the truth by preaching the truth of God's word. And now, this is the this is the ver- next verse is the verse that absolutely uh, affirms the fact that he has prayed for all of his elect. Not this is not just directed at the apostles. He says, "Neither pray I for these alone." Neither pray I for these alone, but, and here's, here's, here's the comfort to my heart, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, I love the Gospel of John here. John wrote this. Uh, John was one of his uh, disciples that he uh, was alluding to here in, in, uh, that, that the Father had given him. And uh, I love to read after John, John's Gospel. I like uh, to read Peter. Peter was one of the apostles. I I believe his word when he says, kept by the power of God, reserved, reserved for me in heaven. I like to read uh, one of the later apostles, Paul. I believe his words. Uh, I believe that... uh, James, when he said uh, James was one of, you know, of course he was a brother of Christ, but uh, I believe uh, James when he said that uh, of his own will he beget us. Of his own will he beget us. Uh, He knew, James knew that, uh, understood predestination. Um, he understood the doctrine of predestination and election, and he endorsed it. If you look in James 1, the 18th verse, he says, Of his own will beget he us, with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. He says, James says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. James knew that all of Christ's little children came from the Father, and he said of his own will, beget he us, of his own will. Not of our will, not of the free will of man, but of his own will. Uh, Now we're, we're back here, so he's saying here that Neither pray I for these, speaking of the apostles alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Okay. Um... You know, now how many people was he praying for the world of his elect there or was he praying for the whole world? He was praying for the world of his elect. That the world of your elect may believe that thou hast sent me. I mean, if he had prayed for the whole world, okay, that uh, to the Father, that the whole world would believe that he had been sent by the Father, then his prayer has not been answered, has it? I mean, we've got a whole nation of Islam and Muhammad's that don't believe that Jesus Christ was sent by the Father. They pray to Allah. And so if this, if he's speaking here that that the whole world may believe, now one of these days the whole world will believe. (laughs) Okay? One of these days, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
But uh, he's praying here for the world of his elect. Okay? In 22, he says, And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they, me speaking of his, the ones that the Father has, has given, Jesus, that they may be made perfect. That they may be made perfect. Um, in one that they that the world may know that thou lovest me and that thou hast loved them and thou hast loved me um, Father I will also that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am what a comfort to us if we're in Christ, if we believe Christ's words, if we believe the truth of the gospel, that that He came and He died for those whom the Father had given Him, if we believe that, then we also know for certainty that Jesus Christ just prayed for us to the Father that all of those whom the Father gave Him would be with Him where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Um, this is an eternal priesthood. This is a this is back to Melchizedek days. This is he has no beginning and he has no ending. This love that he loved his sheep was an everlasting love before the foundation of the world, just like he loved Christ before the foundation of the world. He loved us before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee. What world is he speaking of there? Is he speaking of the world of his elect? Or is he speaking of the world of those who were created as vessels of wrath fitted for destruction? He says... I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. These aren't the world of those uh, people that don't believe. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. What a, what a phenomenal... Uh, lesson we have here. I mean, this to me is probably the most uh, uh, resonated, re uh, most uh, clear teaching in the Bible of the profound love of the Father for His sheep that He gives to Christ who comes and dies. You know, there was a proclamation that he came to save his people from their sins because his people were given to him by the Father. They were loved from eternity by the Father. And they had to be uh, ransomed from spiritual death by the Son. Well, I've gone way over today. You can tell I, I'm on a tangent <laughs> because I love this passage so well. I, it's, I You know, it's... It's life-changing to realize the power, uh, the the absolute power of unity between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit draws us to Christ. The Father gives us to Christ. The Holy Spirit is the one that draws us. And uh, we're reborn, we're given uh, rebirth uh, before we even believe, we're given rebirth. We wouldn't be able to believe because we're dead. We're given rebirth, and then we, the Holy Spirit quickens us, and we believe. We draw drawn to Christ. And uh, anyway, I've got to discontinue this. Hopefully, this won't be too much memory to go on to your email. Lord, we thank you for this passage of Scripture that is so exciting to us to realize that you've. Uh, prayed for us, if we are your children. You prayed for us to the Father that we would be with Him, that we all might be one. And Father, help us live our lives that will show an example that we truly are your sheep, that we're not just giving lip service to it. We fail so often, but there's a great comfort in knowing that in all of our failings that uh, 
you prayed for us like you prayed for Peter. And uh, we thank you for the work you've completed. It had nothing to do with us, but it was finished before the foundation of the world. And you came in time and did the work as well. We thank you for that uh, as an example to us of your power and your glory. We ask this. You would drive this passage of Scripture home to the hearers for whom it was intended. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.